As Elon Musk often says, space travel is something that people all around the world can get excited about, as it's not just individual countries winning, but rather the entirety of humanity. From establishing a base on the moon and Mars to eventually venturing out of the solar system, it's no doubt that space travel is the future long term. But despite this, currently, space isn't the most profitable of businesses, as the space market is really just limited to governments and companies launching various satellites. However, as space travel becomes accessible to the average customer, it's only a matter of time until SpaceX's valuation launches for the stars. But when it does, how high can they get? Well, starting off, looking into the next 30 years, the two main businesses for SpaceX would be Starlink and Starship. Near the end of this video, we'll discuss the potential of asteroid mining. But first, taking a look at Starlink, this project is supposed to make high-speed internet available to rural and remote places using satellite internet. The vast majority of rural and remote places are neglected by the big internet providers like AT&T and Spectrum because it simply doesn't make economical sense for them to set up the necessary infrastructure to support a relatively small group of people. This is especially true for technological advancements such as fiber optic cables. The thing is, it makes sense for AT&T to install fiber optic cables in a large city to potentially win over some market share. However, what's the point of installing fiber optic in the middle of Nebraska where they already have 100% market share? And this is where Starlink makes its entry. Unlike traditional internet providers, SpaceX doesn't have to build infrastructure specific to each community. Instead, they can simply launch a bunch of satellites which can serve people both in the centers of New York and London, as well as people in the Amazon rainforest and Sahara Desert. Traditional infrastructure costs can only be spread amongst a given community's population. However, SpaceX's satellite costs can be spread amongst their entire customer base and this is a root of their profit. So that's the market for Starlink and why they don't really need to fight head on with any providers to win over this market. With that being said, how many people will actually use this? Well, just recently, SpaceX requested permission from the US to deploy 5 million user terminals, which is up from their original request of 1 million. And that's just for users within the US. The US only has about a 20th of the world population, so this should scale up to 100 million customers globally. But of course, not all countries have the same purchasing power as the US and Starlink may not be available in many countries. So we'll say that global demand is just a quarter of that at 25 million during the early stages of Starlink or basically the next decade. Now I'm sure that with good speeds, latency and prices, SpaceX could capture hundreds of millions of customers within the next few decades. But I don't really think they care to do this. Starlink is more of a, hey, let's fund Mars by helping people who are getting screwed over by their internet providers, as opposed to, hey, let's become the most dominant broadband service in the world. So I doubt they'll be too aggressive when expanding, especially after other projects become more viable. Thus, we'll say that they stabilize at about double their initial demand, which would put them at about 50 million worldwide customers, and we can reasonably expect this to occur within the next 20 years. As for the pricing of Starlink services, the expected price is $80 a month, and the average sale price will likely be upwards of $100 a month, but we'll call it 80 to estimate conservatively. With 50 million subscribers at $80 a month, we get 4 billion in revenue per month, or about $50 billion in revenue per year. To put this in perspective, AT&T pulls in between $170 and $180 billion annually off of just the US market. Currently, the global broadband service market is worth $326.7 billion, but this is expected to grow 9% per year up until 2027, which would increase the market to $597 billion. So, by the time Starlink gets to $50 billion in revenue annually, they'll control about 5-10% to of the global market, which is definitely a solid portion, but nothing dominant. As for their profit from Starlink, well, satellite internet providers today aren't exactly profitable. For instance, taking a look at Viasat, 
who is a nationwide satellite internet provider, they're essentially breaking even. They've had some positive years and some negative years, but most of their profits and losses are well below 1% of their annual revenue. For instance, over the past 12 months, they've lost $1 million, which is nothing for a company pulling in over $2 billion in revenue annually. Moreover, their gross profit has been consistently increasing, so their lack of profitability seems to be a result of expansion as opposed to a bad business model. Thus, giving Starlink a very reasonable net profit margin of just 3%, they would still pull in about $1.5 billion per year. That's nearly their entire current annual revenue, so this would definitely give them a lot of room to invest and advance their various technologies. Speaking of new technology, their next big project that will bring in massive revenue and profit is of course Starship. Starship is primarily being developed to enable interplanetary travel, specifically to Mars. But let's be real here, how many people will not only want to visit, but also be able to pay half a million dollars to visit Mars? Now don't get me wrong here, getting people to Mars will likely be one of the biggest achievements in human history. But from a business perspective, it's really not going to make that much money, at least not in the next few decades. The real monetary potential for Starship is with intraplanetary travel, or travel within the Earth. SpaceX is planning to use Starship to provide super fast travel within the Earth for journeys like Houston to Dubai and Dubai to Sydney, as most long distance trips can be completed with Starship in less than 30 minutes. So, for most travelers, it would be a no-brainer to use Starship for long-distance travel as opposed to regular airliners as it would save several hours each way. Really, the only barriers for Starship are price and safety, which are of course, very serious issues. Right now, SpaceX is still planning to use Starship to get to Mars in 2024. I'm not quite sure that that time frame will quite work out, but I do think they'll have Starship ready to go within the next 5 to 10 years. But that doesn't mean that it'll be accessible to the average person by 2030. Starship will no doubt have to jump through many hoops to prove its long-term safety and win over government approval for consumer use. As a result, it will likely take 5 to 10 years of cargo missions and limited human testing before governments allow Starship to fly over land and take customers on a regular basis and such. So, we're likely looking at 2040 before Starship really goes mainstream and starts to eat up market share from the airlines. But once this process begins, there's no stopping it, and here's why. Starship prices will be significantly higher than airlines, but they're not too bad. SpaceX hopes to achieve a per launch cost of $2 million, and that's to Mars, where both Starship and the Super Heavy Booster will need to be fueled up. For intraplanetary travel, only Starship, or the top part of a rocket, is expected to be used, which in the words of Elon Musk, dramatically improves cost, complexity, and the ease of operations. This is quite obvious, as you're only using half the rocket. So, point-to-point -point travel will likely have a per launch cost closer to $1 million. But we'll say that this is super ambitious, and that Mars launches end up costing $4 million in 2040. That would make point-to-point -point launches about 2 million. We also have expenses other than the launch itself. For instance, they'll have to pay a ground crew, inspectors between flights, maybe buy some licenses, you get the point. We'll say that external costs add up to half a million dollars per launch. Throw in another half million for profit or a 16.6% .6 margin, and we have a per launch cost of about $3 million. The good part is that this is spread over 1,000 passengers, which comes out to per passenger price of 3000 Over time though, this cost is simply going to go down as SpaceX increases efficiency, so we'll likely see a price in the two dollars to $3,000 range in the first 5-10 to 10 years of the service. And that makes sense, as Gwen Shotwell, who is the chief operating officer of SpaceX, has stated that Earth-to-Earth -Earth tickets will cost between economy and business class flight tickets. Currently, a one-way flight ticket from New York to Dubai costs a little over 800 bucks for Emirates. Upgrading that ticket to business class will take that price up to $4,500. First class, on the other hand, will push it up to $14,500.
but that's irrelevant to our calculation. Anyways, something else to keep in mind is that these ticket prices are with pandemic savings. So on a regular day, we're likely looking at upwards of $1,000 for economy and upwards of $5,000 for business. As a result, Starship lands right in the middle. So yes, Starship will cost two to three times more than the regular flight ticket, at least at the start. But I don't think this is nearly as big of a problem as it might seem. You have to keep in mind that Starship provides exponential value. Yes, it's two to three times the price, but it also shortens a 14 hour flight to half an hour or 28 times faster. And people who travel internationally aren't generally broke. They can afford to buy business class if they wanted to, but they don't think it's worth the price. In other words, we generally don't want to throw several thousand dollars down the drain for some extra legroom and a larger TV. Heck, even after Bill Gates became a multi-billionaire, he would travel in the economy until of course he got his own jet. Thus, the logic of flying economy isn't usually, I can't afford business, but rather, why pay more to travel on the same plane? However, when we are shown exponential value, we are always ready to pay more, and this has been proven time and time again throughout history. For instance, third class tickets on the Titanic started at $15 which is the same as $107 today. And the Titanic was a 137 hour voyage. Today, a one-way flight ticket from London to New York costs a minimum of $285 with no stops. And that's again with the pandemic savings. Usually, such a ticket would cost well into the 300s or about double the price of the Titanic. Thus, people were willing to spend two times the price to reduce travel time exponentially. Aside from that, people have been very willing to spend money on advanced technology. The iPhone was 10 times the price of the average phone when it came out, but given exponential advantages, Apple has sold 2.2 billion phones since launch. Similarly, when did dropping tens of thousands on a car become normal, and when did spending thousands of dollars on computers become ordinary? Evidently, people adopt new technology even when it's 5 to 10 times more expensive, if the value is large enough. Thus, as long as people feel safe, we'll see a significant proportion of all long distance travelers switch to Starship, not just business travelers, especially when it's only two to three times the cost which many will be willing to pay. With all of that being said, in 2018, global airline revenue was $824 billion and it was growing at 9.4% per year. Of course, we're seeing an artificial pullback right now but things will likely go back to normal by 2022. So assuming $824 billion in revenue in 2022 and 9.4% growth per year starting then, we would see $4.151 trillion in global airline revenue by 2040. Assuming growth slows down in the 2030s, we'll still see about $3 trillion in annual revenue by 2040, or about triple what we have now. And this is in line with many projections of increased demand over the next few decades. In 2019, we had 4.7 billion global airline passengers. The ACI or Airports Council International expects that traffic will reach 19.7 billion by 2040 or over four times more than today. As for what proportion of these flights are long haul flights, we don't have access to international data. However, the United Kingdom has released its data. In 2020, without a pandemic, they expected to have upwards of 100 million long haul flights and upwards of 200 million short haul flights. So for them, about one third of their flights are long haul flights. But something to keep in mind is that though only one third of these flights are long haul flights, these one third of flights account for much more than one third of airline revenue as long haul flight tickets simply cost significantly more. As a result, long haul flights likely account for 40 to 50% of airline revenue or about $1.2 to $1.5 trillion in annual revenue by 2040. As for what proportion of these passengers will switch over to Starship, well, business and first class bookings account for about 11% of flight tickets. And the vast majority of this crowd will switch over to Starship as they're already paying for airline fares that well exceed the cost of a Starship ticket. And saving time is very important, especially because they travel on a regular basis. Thus, assuming that 90% of these travelers will switch over to Starship by 2050, 
That would allow SpaceX to capture 10% of the long haul market. As for the 89% of economy customers, we'll assume that about a third of them are willing to pay more to save time, thus giving Starship 40% of the long haul market by 2050. At this rate, SpaceX would pull in passengers who are paying $500 billion per year. But we have to keep in mind that for the majority of these passengers, SpaceX tickets cost two to three times more than their previous tickets. So SpaceX would actually be pulling in revenue between one and one and a half trillion dollars annually. Airlines typically have net profit margins of about 10%. But SpaceX is offering a premium service for a premium price, not to mention that they will likely have no competition, at least at the beginning. Thus, with $1 trillion in revenue and a net profit margin of 15%, SpaceX would profit $150 billion annually. As you can see, Starship will dwarf profit from Starlink. And that brings us into the final source of revenue for SpaceX, which is asteroid mining. But there's one major flaw with this plan. Elon Musk doesn't think that space mining will be profitable, and he has made this clear several times. He simply thinks that the cost of transport will outweigh the cost of this mining on Earth. Moreover, an influx of precious metals such as gold and silver would likely lead to a drop in value due to greater supply. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like Elon wants to get SpaceX into the asteroid mining business anytime soon. But aside from asteroid mining not being profitable, I think that the main reason Elon doesn't want to get into space mining business is because he doesn't find it to be a problem. Though Elon Musk has made tens of billions from his various companies, at heart he's an engineer. And though he agrees that SpaceX needs to make money to make progress, money isn't really the goal for him, but rather solving problems. Starlink provides internet to remote and rural areas, and Starship enables exponentially faster intraplanetary travel as well as interplanetary travel. But what does space mining accomplish? Give people more jewelry? If the Earth desperately needed more precious metals to move society forward in some manner, I'm sure he'd focus on space mining. But as this is currently not the case, I think he'll stick to lowering the cost of space travel and exploration. In the meantime, SpaceX is already profiting $150 billion annually from Starlink and Starship. And we'll call all of their profit from moon and Mars launches and everything else to be our margin of error. So as for the company's valuation, Elon Musk has suggested that he'll keep the company private for the time being to avoid market volatility. However, we may very well see an IPO after SpaceX has achieved regular flights to Mars, at which point they will be a much more stable company. As for their PE ratio or the ratio between yearly net profit and market valuation, SpaceX is likely to have a sky-high PE ratio due to its future on Mars and possibly other planets as well. Thus, expecting a PE ratio of 100 is not really that far off, given that Amazon has a PE ratio of 127 and that Tesla has a PE ratio of over 1000. With a PE ratio of 100, SpaceX would be worth $15 trillion. But even with a more grounded PE ratio in the 30s like most popular tech companies, SpaceX would be worth $5 trillion. Thus, SpaceX will likely be worth about $10 trillion by the end of 2050 after executing Starlink and point-to-point -point travel using Starship. By 2100 though, who knows where SpaceX will be as they're by history. How high do you guys think SpaceX can get by the end of the century? Comment that down below. And of course, Drop a like if you guys appreciate the depth of this video and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari and I'll see you guys on the next one.